I'm not given to quoting Francis Bacon approvingly, but I must admit that one cannot improve upon the opening line of his own famous essay on our subject. What is truth, said jesting Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. This is usually taken to reflect Pilate's cynicism. No doubt he also lacked a taste for metaphysics. Only slightly less cynical, but similarly devoid of an interest in metaphysics, remarkably given some of his adventures, was that renowned archaeologist Indiana Jones, who once assured his class that, as a science, his discipline was concerned with, quote, the search for fact, not truth. If it's truth you're interested in, Dr. Tyree's philosophy class is right down the hall, unquote. That's from uh, Indiana Jones in the uh, Last Crusade, I think. YouTube it. Yet most modern philosophy professors are, in fact, only somewhat more open-minded on the subject. To be sure, contemporary analytic philosophers are considerably more tolerant of metaphysics than were their logical positivist, pragmatist, and ordinary language philosophy forebears. But where the metaphysics of truth is concerned, that tolerance quickly reaches its limits. Their answer to Pilate would be that truth is a pretty mundane property. To be sure, they disagree about exactly what are the truth bearers, as they put it, to which this property should be attributed. The candidates include A, utterances understood as noises or marks generated at a particular time and place, as when you write or speak snow is white at noon next Friday, the sentence snow is white. B, sentences in the sense of it, the type of which particular utterances are tokens. For example, my utterance now of the sentence snow is white and your utterance next Friday of snow is white are tokens of the same sentence type. C, a third candidate, is beliefs in the sense of the mental states of which sentences and utterances are expressions. And D, the propositions that serve as the contents of beliefs and are conveyed through a sentence or utterance. As when you and a German speaker believe or convey the same proposition when you think and utter snow is white and he thinks or utters Schnee is Weiss. Contemporary philosophers also disagree about the nature of the property they attribute to whichever of these candidates, uh, candidate truth bearers they favor. Some say that truth is the correspondence of the truth bearer with reality. Some say that it is the coherence with other truth bearers. Others say that it has to do with the truth bearers having pragmatic value. And yet others take what's called the deflationist view that to say that snow is white is true is really nothing more than simply to assert that snow is white, rather than to attribute some property whose nature needs to be captured by a correspondence, coherence, or pragmatist theory. But what these views have in common is a tendency to limit the application of the notion of truth to phenomena of a linguistic, psychological, or logical sort, rather than anything having grand metaphysical significance. As William Alston notes, in recent philosophy, the most popular of the candidate truth bearers has been sentences, rather than the by far more plausible candidate propositions, because the latter would seem to entail a commitment to the reality of, quote, abstract entities, that is, for the taste of most contemporary academic philosophers, too metaphysically extravagant. Now, notwithstanding the generally greater anti-metaphysical animus of earlier generations of analytic philosophers, one will actually find somewhat more metaphysically adventurous attitudes, at least on the question of truth, if one looks at some earlier works in that tradition, in the analytic tradition. For example, Alan White's 1970 book, Truth, allows that there are two sorts of things that can be said to be true. First, there is what he calls what is said, which more or less corresponds to propositions. But second, there are, quote, things other than what is said, examples of which would be what we have in mind when we describe something as true courage or true mahogany, or characterize a person or as a true patriot or a true Yorkshireman. These are uh, White's examples. However, White nevertheless takes the use of true to describe what is said to be the primary use of the word. Then there is Gottlob Frege's classic 1918 essay, Thoughts, the broadly platonic tenor of which is certainly the opposite of anti-metaphysical. By a thought, Frege has in mind what he calls the sense of a sentence, and what contemporary philosophers call a proposition, and he insists that it cannot be identified with anything linguistic or psychological. Our knowledge of propositions is, in Frege's view, knowledge of a third realm, distinct from both the material world and the human mind. However, like White, he has little interest in how the word true might be applied to things other than propositions, as when we use the term, quote, in the sense of genuine, or when it is prefixed to another word in order to show that the word is to be understood in its proper, unadulterated sense, unquote, quoting from Frege. On the contrary, Frege claims that propositions are, quote, the only thing that raises the question of truth at all, unquote. Hence, he judges truth as a subject matter of logic, just as beauty is the subject matter of aesthetics, goodness the subject matter of ethics, and weight and heat subject matters of physics. It is likely that Frege is the immediate source of the modern analytic philosopher's reflexive tendency to suppose that linguistic, psychological, and logical phenomena exhaust the range of possible things, 
to which truth might arguably be attributable. Certainly, they rarely consider the views of earlier thinkers. For instance, in Michael Lynch's anthology, The Nature of Truth, Classic and Contemporary Perspectives, the classic readings go all the way back to an 1878 essay by C.S. Peirce. The unwary reader might conclude that no philosopher had much to say about the topic prior to that time, that Augustine was not, in fact, what one writer calls, quote, the doctor par excellence of the philosophy of truth, and that Aquinas had never written De Veritate. And yet occasionally a contemporary philosopher will evince a sense that there might be more to the story. Indeed, that as even a philosopher is little given to piety, as Simon Blackburn allows, quote, there is an air of divinity that hangs over the concept of truth, unquote. Now, in what follows, I will set out with the medievals, building on hints provided by the ancients, took to be the rest of the story about truth, and indeed the most important part of the story. As we will see, the scholastics distinguish between logical truth and ontological truth. Modern analytic philosophers focus more or less exclusively on the former, but for Augustine, Aquinas, and other medieval philosophers, it is ontological truth that is more fundamental, and the proper understanding of it has dramatic metaphysical implications. Truth is one of the transcendental properties of all being, and in the final analysis is indeed literally divine. Most contemporary analytic philosophers will no doubt find such claims mystifying, but that is precisely because they are fixated on truth in the logical sense. To see how there could be truth in some other philosophically interesting sense requires some stage setting. I will begin in the next section with an exposition of the doctrine of the transcendentals in general. This will prepare the way for the subsequent section's explanation of what it means to say that truth is a transcendental property of being, which is central to the notion of ontological truth. In the final section, I will consider some of the philosophical and theological implications of the notion of ontological truth. Of course, the contemporary philosopher will want to know not only what the notion of truth as a transcendental amounts to and what its implications are, but also why we should believe that there is such a thing in the first place. The short answer is that, as we shall see, the notion is a natural outgrowth of more fundamental metaphysical ideas which, as a result of the neo-Aristotelian revival currently underway, many contemporary philosophers are already willing to reconsider. I would submit that if they're willing to push the envelope as far as reevaluating neo-Aristotelian essentialism and teleology, just a little further pushing is needed in order to regard the doctrine of the transcendentals, too, as a live option. Okay, so this brings us to the next section on the transcendentals in general. The concept of being, the Thomist holds, is the most fundamental and familiar of all concepts. The first thing conceived by the intellect, says Aquinas, is being. Precisely for that reason, it is difficult to get one's mind around. Properly to grasp it, as Orwell said of what is in front of one's nose, needs a constant struggle. We might start by proposing reality, quote unquote, as a synonym for being. What has being is what is in some way real. But obviously that only takes us so far. Can we say more? Yes, much more, which is where the doctrine of the transcendentals comes in. But before turning to that, it is worthwhile to consider uh, further why the concept is so difficult to elucidate. For ironically, this itself helps us to begin to clarify its nature, nature of the concept of being. For one thing, the concept of being is simple or primitive in the sense that we cannot analyze it without remainder into more elementary notions. For any concepts we might appeal to in order to analyze the concept of being will themselves represent either a kind of being or the absence of being and thus presuppose the concept of being. Concept of being is also the first of our concepts both logically and chronologically insofar as for us initially to grasp anything at all is to grasp it as a kind of being or reality or at least as a possible kind of being a reality. Even when we judge a thing to be unreal, we do so precisely by contrast to what has being or is real. The concept of being is maximally indeterminate and abstract insofar as it covers all possible kinds of reality, actuality and potentiality, essence and existence, substances and attributes, form and matter, the corporeal and the incorporeal, and so on. But without further specification, it refers to none of these in particular. Being cannot strictly be defined, as Thomists understand definition, because if there is, there is no genus that being falls under, let alone a specific difference to distinguish it from other species in a genus. For any species, genus and specific difference are themselves kinds of being. At the same time, neither for the Thomist is being itself any kind of genus, not even the widest genus. For a genus is always divisible into species by way of specific differences that are outside the concept of the genus. For example, the specific difference rationality is outside the concept of the genus animal, which is why we can distinguish that genus into the species rational animal and the various kinds of non-rational animals. But since every specific difference has being, there is none that lies outside the concept of being by which we might divide being into species. 
For this reason, being is a transcendental notion. That is to say, it transcends all genera, let alone all species, of thing, and applies to all of them. Now, the first thing the doctrine of the transcendental says is that there are several concepts which in this way apply to all reality. There are six others in addition to being. Thing, one, other, true, good, and with qualifications to be noted presently, beautiful. Second thing the doctrine of the transcendental says is that these are all convertible with being. That is to say, what all of them represent is really just being considered from different points of view. To be sure, terms like one, true, and good are not synonymous with the word being. But to apply Frege's famous distinction, though they differ in sense, they are identical in reference. This is how they deepen our knowledge of the nature of being. They add to our understanding of being itself conceptual content that is not present in our notion of being. To be more precise, proponents of the doctrine are in agreement that at least three of the transcendentals add conceptual content that is not contained in the concept of being, but that names features that follow immediately from the things having being, namely one, true, and good. The status of the other transcendentals is more controversial. These three are accordingly often referred to as the transcendental properties of being. They are not properties in the strictest sense, since again, they are not really distinct from being in the way that a substance and its properties or proper accidents are really distinct. But they can, in a loose sense, be characterized as properties insofar as, again, the concept of being one, the concept of being true, and the concept of being good add content to our grasp of being that is clearly not contained in the concept of being itself. Moreover, they refer to features that follow immediately from a thing's having being in a way comparable to a property's following immediately from a substance's essence. For being to be one is for it to be undivided. Aquinas argues that all being is one as follows. Any being is either simple or composite. If it is simple or non-composite, then, then it is naturally undivided. If it is composite, then it has being only insofar as its parts are actually combined, in which case, again, it is undivided. So either way, any being is undivided. For being to be true is for it to conform to the concept that an intellect has of it, and thereby to be intelligible. For example, a dog has being qua dog insofar as it conforms to the concept of dog, which represents the essence of dogginess. In so conforming, it counts as a true dog. If it failed to conform to this concept, it would fail to have being qua dog, since it would lack the essence of a dog. Of course, it would in that case really be some other thing, such as a piece of wood that merely looked like a dog. But in that case, it would have being qua wood, and thus conform to the concept of wood, and thus have the essence of wood. It would be true wood, even if not a true dog. In this way, any being is true insofar as it is a true something or other, and will fall under some concept or other. Now, this is the transcendental that we are primarily concerned with here, so I will have much more to say about it presently. But let's first round out our look at the other transcendentals. For being to be good is for it to realize the ends toward which its nature directs it. For example, a dog has being qua dog insofar as it has actually developed the physiological and behavioral traits characteristic of dogs. To the extent that it has done so, it is a good dog in the sense of a good specimen of its kind. To the extent it fails to do so, it would be an imperfect dog and thus less good a specimen. This might be because it is not yet fully mature or because it has been damaged in some way. Either way, the absence of the traits in question and thus the absence of what makes for a good specimen will amount to a failure to realize some end toward which its nature directs it. Such failure entails less of the kinds of being that a dog qua dog is supposed to have. This yields an account of badness as a privation of being, the absence of some reality that a perfectly good specimen of a kind would exhibit. Again, to say that something is one, true, or good clearly adds conceptual content that is not contained in the statement that something has being. That is why these can, in a loose sense, be characterized as transcendental properties of being. More controversial among proponents of the doctrine of the transcendentals is whether additional conceptual content is added by any of the other transcendentals. Hence, any being is also a thing of some sort. But the concept of thing arguably adds nothing that is not already implicit in the concept of being. The most that can be said is that the accent in the case of the concept of thing is on essence, whereas the accent in the case of the concept of being is on existence, but where both essence and existence are nevertheless implicit in both concepts. Any being is also other than a distinct being, but this is a consequence not of its having being, but rather of its being one. Then there is the concept of the beautiful, which Aquinas says applies to things insofar as they are pleasing when apprehended. The claim that all being is beautiful is, when properly understood, true enough for proponents of the doctrine of the transcendentals. However, on analysis, a thing's beauty will be a consequence of its being true or good. In particular, it will please when apprehended, either because it is seen to conform to the concept that an intellect forms of its essence, 
or because it is seen to conform to the end to which it is directed. Hence, like the concept of other, the concept of beautiful names a feature that does not follow immediately from a thing's having being in the way that the features named by the concepts one, true, and good do. Beauty is a sort of byproduct of goodness or truth, in other words. So, though in addition to the concept of being, there are six further transcendental concepts, one, true, good, thing, other, and beauty, only three of them are taken by all proponents of the doctrine of the transcendentals to name transcendental properties, namely one true and good. Now, the order in which I've listed these three properties of being is by no means arbitrary, but is taken by writers like Aquinas to correspond to an order in reality. Being is one in an absolute way, but it is true or good relative to something else, to the concept that an intellect has of it in the one case and to the end toward which an inclination or appetite is directed in the other. Moreover, the intellect understands a thing only insofar as it takes to be one, and a thing is directed toward an end only by virtue of the essence of which the intellect forms a concept. Hence, Aquinas writes, quote, the order of these transcendent names accordingly, if they are considered in themselves, is as follows. After being comes the one, after the one comes the true, and after the true comes good, unquote. We might represent the transcendentals and their relationships to one another by way of the following diagram, which you will now see on your, uh, your handout there. I've got one true and good there in the center with the box around them to indicate that those are the transcendental properties of being, and the other transcendentals all in capital letters there with their relationships to one another described there in those descriptions. Now, much more could, of course, be said about the transcendentals in general. Not all proponents of the doctrine would spell it out exactly as I have, and needless to say, many philosophers would not accept it at all. My aim here has not been to provide a complete exposition and defense, but rather to provide the context for the discussion of truth specifically as a transcendental property. Suffice it for present purposes to say the following in defense of the general doctrine of the transcendentals. I would suggest that it is a natural view to adopt if one is already attracted, attracted to a broadly Aristotelian metaphysics, and that resistance to it tends to flow from metaphysical assumptions that no one attracted to Aristotelianism can sympathize with. In particular, I would submit that resistance to the idea that good is a transcendental property of being is a consequence of the reflexive tendency of modern philosophers to conceptualize nature in a broadly mechanistic or anti-teleological way. I would suggest that resistance to the idea that truth is a transcendental property of being is a byproduct of the sympathy that many modern philosophers have for a broadly nominalist metaphysics on which the essences of things are created by the mind rather than discovered by it. I would suggest that resistance to the idea that one is a transcendental property of being is a result of the tendency to think of nature in reductionist terms. Even being might seem less than certainly objective to a philosopher influenced by idealism, relativism, or some form of anti-realism. The influence of such views has been so great in modern philosophy that even contemporary philosophers who do not accept them find it metaphysically adventurous to propose that concepts like one, true, and good represent features to be found in all of extra mental reality. Hence, if with an increasing number of contemporary philosophers, one is willing to question the assumptions of modern philosophy and to reconsider neo-Aristotelian ideas like essentialism and teleology, one ought also to be open to reconsidering the doctrine of the transcendentals. Now we come to the next section on ontological truth. The scholastic thinkers who hammered out the doctrine of the transcendentals distinguish between logical truth and ontological truth. Logical truth is the kind which might be attributed to propositions, beliefs, sentences, and utterances. It is, again, the kind to which contemporary analytic philosophers tend to confine their attention. Ontological truth is truth considered as a transcendental property of being. It is both attributed to reality itself rather than to what we think or say about reality. Something is true in this sense when it is what we call the genuine article or the real McCoy. It is what uh, Alan White has in mind when he notes that truth might be predicated of, quote, things other than what is said, unquote, such as true courage, true mahogany, a true patriot, or a true Yorkshireman, to take his earlier examples. But in light of the doctrine of the transcendentals, it is a notion of greater metaphysical significance than White attributes to it. Now, truth in either sense has to do with the relationship between being and intellect, but the direction of the relationship is different in each case. Logical truth has to do with the conformity of the intellect to being. Ontological truth has to do with the conformity of being to the intellect. To borrow some phrases from contemporary speech act theory, we might say that logical and ontological truth have different directions of fit. Lo logical truth has a mind to world direction of fit, and ontological truth has a world to mind direction of fit. It is clear enough what this means in the case of logical truth. To say that a belief, a proposition, a sentence, or an utterance is true when it corresponds to reality is a familiar thesis that goes back at least to Aristotle. And though concepts, not being complete thoughts, are not assigned truth values in logic, 
in the way that propositions are, there is an obvious sense in which a concept can be true insofar as it can be said accurately to capture the essence of the thing it is a concept of. Though, as Aquinas argues, what is true in the strictest sense is the intellect's judgment that its concept of something is accurate, rather than the concept itself, which is true only in a secondary sense. For an intellect to conform to being, then, is for its concepts accurately to convey the nature of their reference and for its beliefs to correspond to reality. But what is it, what is it for being to conform to intellect? To a first approximation, and as I've already indicated, it has to do with something's conforming to the intellect's concept of its essence. For example, a true triangle is a triangle that conforms to the concept of a closed plane figure with three straight sides. Now, this might seem problematic in two respects. First, it may seem to give the lie to my earlier remark that ontological truth is more fundamental than logical truth. Logical truth is a property of thought and language. Ontological truth is supposed to be something different, a property of reality independent of thought and language. But now it might seem, it turns out, that all that that amounts to is realities reflecting the way that thought and language represent it. So it might seem that logical truth is in the driver's seat after all, and that the notion of ontological truth is less interesting than I have suggested. Second, even if this problem can be resolved, it might seem that we are still left with a second and deeper one, which is that the account is viciously circular. Our concepts are true in the logical sense only insofar as they conform to being, but being is true in the ontological sense only insofar as it conforms to our concepts. How is this not a merry-go-round? Well, the first thing to say in response is that what is claimed, when it is claimed that ontological truth involves conformity of the being of being to the intellect, what is meant is intellect in the abstract, not the human intellect in particular. What other intellects are there? I'll come back to that, but the point for the moment is that ontological truth is independent of human thought and language and would exist even if they did not. Indeed, until the human mind makes contact with external reality by way of sensory experience, there are no concepts in it to which external reality might conform. The way this contact works, according to Thomistic epistemology, is that in forming a concept of a thing and thereby cognizing it, the intellect takes on the form of the thing that it cognizes. As John Haldane suggests, we can begin to understand this by comparison with the way two physical objects of the same kind have the same form. For example, two triangles you might draw on a marker board share the form of a closed plane figure with three straight sides. What happens in our cognition of a triangle is that the intellect too comes to share this form, but by contrast with a physical object that has the form in a way that is divorced from matter. Thought and the thing thought about are formally identical, despite these relata not being materially identical, or in the case of the thought, not being material at all. In this sense, cognition involves what Haldane calls a, quote, mind-world identity. As John Whipple points out, for Aquinas, truth is like universals in that, though both are fully realized only when the intellect abstracts from concrete particulars, Neither is the free creation of the intellect, but has a foundation in mind-independent reality. Hence, when the intellect entertains the concept triangularity and abstraction from particular triangles, it is considering qua universal something that already ex uh, really did exist in the particulars themselves before the mind abstracted it, but qua individualized. Similarly, when the intellect correctly makes a judgment to the effect that this object before me is a closed plane figure with three straight sides, what is present within it under the guise of logical truth is something that already existed in mind independent reality under the guise of ontological truth. Now, all of this illuminates logical truth, ontological truth, and the relationship between them in several ways. For one thing, it entails that the Conformity of intellect to reality and reality to intellect has nothing to do with a relationship of representation, as that is typically understood in post-Cartesian philosophy of mind. It is much more intimate than that. Again, it is a kind of identity, but only formal. For another thing, the account entails that ontological truth is prior to and independent of logical truth. To be sure, a thing's having a certain form gives it an inherent aptness or potentiality for being cognized. There is, in that sense, an implicit reference to the intellect in characterizing it as ontologically true. But until that potentiality is actual, by the presence of a human intellect, there are no concepts, beliefs, utterances, or the like for the thing to conform to. Moreover, human intellects being what they are, they can, of course, sometimes misconceive the objects of thought as a result of misperception, confusion, or whatever. Ontological truth, then, is not fundamentally a matter of a thing's conforming to just any old concept that some human mind actually has, in fact, formed of it. Rather, it is a matter of a thing's conforming to the concept that intellect would entertain upon taking on that thing's form where that very same form is already actually to be found in the thing itself. Whatever one thinks of this thesis, it is a substantive metaphysical claim about what things are like independently of any contingent facts about human thought and language. Just how substantive, we will see in the next section, we look at the implications of the notion of ontological truth. It should also be clear why there is no circularity in the account, as there would be if we were simply defining the truth that exists in the intellect in terms of the truth that exists in being, 
and the truth that exists in being in terms of the truth that exists in the intellect and leaving it at that. Rather, the fundamental notion here is form, understood in the Aristotelian hylomorphous sense as the intrinsic organizing principle of a thing. The intellect is then defined in terms of the capacity to abstract form from matter altogether, thereby generating a concept. Truth is then in turn defined in terms of the way the intellect and the thing it knows conform to one another by virtue of their formal identity, where truth is characterized as logical if looked at from the point of view of the intellect, and ontological if looked at from the point of view of the thing cognized. There is still a puzzle to be resolved, however. I've explained how human thought and language presuppose a mind-independent reality from which the human intellect can abstract forms and thereby generate concepts, so that ontological truth is more fundamental than logical truth. Indeed, ontological truth would exist whether or not human beings had themselves ever existed. Yet I've also nevertheless defined ontological truth in terms of conformity to intellect, and I've said that it is a transcendental property of being, something attributable, attributable to all being as such including what would exist even if human beings did not exist. How can these claims be reconciled? The answer is that they can be reconciled if there is an intellect to which all being would conform, even in the absence of human intellects, specifically. Keep in mind that the position I've been describing, since it is Aristotelian, is also realist. The human intellect discovers rather than creates the essences of natural objects and thus it discovers rather than creates the truths it comes to know about these essences. Hence, these truths do not depend on the existence of human minds, but they also do not depend on the existence of a material world. The proposition that the angles of a Euclidean triangle sum to 180 degrees remains true whether or not there are any actual triangles to be found in the material world. Proposition that Tyrannosaurus rex is a bipedal carnivorous dinosaur remains true even though Tyrannosaurus no longer exist, and so on. Moreover, since these truths follow from the essences of things rather than from any contingent facts about them, they are necessary and eternal. There is also an infinite uh, number of such truths, as can be seen just from the case of mathematics. So realism entails the existence of a body of truths that is immaterial, necessary, eternal, and infinite. But for the Aristotelian, who rejects any Platonic third realm, if such truths are independent of matter, there is no other place to locate them than in an intellect. Hence, there must be an intellect that is, in itself, immaterial, necessary, eternal, and infinite. That is to say, a divine intellect. Now, what I'm re rehearsing here, of course, is what is sometimes called the argument from eternal truths, for the existence of God, which has its roots in Neoplatonism and is associated with the Augustinian tradition. Naturally, it raises all sorts of questions, but this is not the place for a defense, which I have in any case provided elsewhere. Discuss it in my book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Suffice it for uh, available on Amazon and through the Ignatius <laughs> Press. You get your phones out, you can do it as well. I won't, I won't be offended. <laughs> Suffice it for present purposes to note that the scholastics who hammered out the doctrine of the transcendentals, whether or not they endorse this particular argument for God's existence, do embrace the associated idea that the essences of things pre-exist their instantiation in the natural world as concepts in the divine mind, which function as the archetypes by reference to which God creates. This is what grounds ontological truth as a transcendental property of being, which would exist even in the absence of human minds specifically. For all things exhibit ontological truth insofar as they conform to the concept of the divine, the concept that the divine intellect has of them, which serves as the blueprint according to which they were made. Hence, though the truth that resides in human intellects presupposes ontological truth and is therefore less fundamental than it, ontological truth in turn presupposes the truth that resides in the divine intellect and is therefore itself less fundamental than that. Truth cannot get into our minds unless it is first in things, but it cannot get into things unless it is first in the mind of God. Hence, truth is a property of human thoughts in only a secondary or derivative way, but of divine thoughts in a primary way. But we can make a stronger claim even than, uh, even than that when we factor in other theological premises, such as the doctrine of divine simplicity. Since there are no parts in God, there is no distinction in him even between essence and existence. Accordingly, he does not merely have being in the sense of instantiating it. Rather, he just is subsistent being itself. But since truth is convertible with being, the same thing looked at from a different point of view, it follows that he is also just truth itself. Moreover, talk about concepts and truths pre-existing in the divine intellect must be understood in analogical terms. We can say that there is in God something analogous to what we call concepts and thoughts, but whereas in our minds these are distinct entities, in God they are not. Given divine simplicity, God's knowledge, power, goodness, and other attributes are identical. We cannot grasp the divine nature except insofar as we bring it under these distinct concepts, but what, we, what, what they refer to in God God is one and the same thing. In a similar way, in order to grasp the divine intellect to the extent that we are able to, 
we have to attribute to it distinct thoughts and concepts. But given divine simplicity, what these two refer to in God is one and the same thing. Spelling all that out in greater detail would require delving into theological matters that would take us far beyond the metaphysics of truth. Suffice it for present purposes to note that the Augustinian thesis that concepts in the divine intellect are the archetypes according to which God creates is the deepest foundation for the claim that we need a notion of ontological or transcendental truth in addition to the notion of logical truth that is more familiar to modern philosophers. Hence, we can add atheism to the list of isms, mechanism, nominalism, reductionism, etc., whose influence on modern thought has, as I suggested earlier, made contemporary philosophers reluctant to credit the doctrine of the transcendentals. I hasten to add that that is not to say that there are no non-theological considerations indicating that the ontological notion of truth as conformity of being to intellect cannot entirely be replaced by the logical notion of truth as conformity of intellect to being. John Peterson gives the example of Phidias working through the several failed attempts to sculpt Athena before succeeding in declaring of the resulting statue, quote, that is the true Athena, unquote. As Peterson points out, it will not do to suggest that what is expressed by this statement can be entirely captured by the thesis that Phidias' belief or utterance conforms to the final statue. Rather, it has to do more fundamentally with the final statues conforming to Phidias' concept of it in a way that the failed attempts did not. In other words, we cannot make sense of Phidias' statement except as a remark about ontological truth rather than logical truth. We ought also to factor in the familiar scholastic thesis that whatever, that whatever is in an effect must in some way first be in its cause. Logical truth resides in utterances, statements, and more fundamentally in the thoughts of which utterances and statements are expressions. But it gets into our thoughts only because of the contact that the intellect makes with reality outside it. Hence, for truth to get into the intellect, it must first in some way be in this external reality. That is to say, logical truth must presuppose ontological truth. So there is much we can say in defense of ontological truth before making reference to distinctively theological considerations. But it's when we pursue things to the deepest level that we find that those considerations are unavoidable. For again, truth of either the logical or the ontological kind essentially involves some relation to an intellect, and we therefore need to find some intellect to ground it in, in real and imagined contexts where truth exists, but no finite intellects are to be found. If there is ontological truth, is there also ontological falsity? Obviously, a thing of one type might give the false appearance of being a thing of another type. For example, pyrite can appear to be gold and thus might be called false gold, but only in a loose sense because the falsity in this case is really in our judgment that it is gold written and not in the pyrite itself. Indeed, considered in itself, it is true. That is to say, it is true pyrite. Aquinas' view is that, strictly speaking, and in relation to the divine intellect, nothing can be false. Certainly, the divine intellect is, unlike ours, incapable of making an erroneous judgment about what a thing is. Manualists generally seem to follow Aquinas in holding that, strictly speaking, nothing can be ontologically false. It seems to me, though, that a thing might plausibly be said to be ontologically false in a stronger sense than that in which pyrite is false gold. After all, no line, circle, or triangle to be found in the physical world will have the perfection captured by our concepts of these geometrical entities, and by the concepts of them that pre-exist as archetypes in the divine intellect. In falling short of it, it seems that there is a sense in which they can be said to fail to be perfectly true in a way that is analogous to how a thing can fail to be perfectly good. Indeed, since goodness and truth are both transcendental properties of being and thus convertible, it seems that there should be something like ontological falsity to parallel evil qua privation of goodness. The 19th century neo-scholastic philosopher Thomas Harper considered and rejected such a view, but for reasons which do not seem to me to be strong. His opening move is to suggest that the notion of ontological truth is a contradiction in terms. For if something has being, then, given the convertibility of being and truth, how can it be false? But this seems to me like saying that since being is convertible, is convertible with goodness, no being can be bad. All that actually follows in the case of goodness is that no being can be bad in every respect, but it can be bad in some respects, even if good in others. So why couldn't, be a, why couldn't a being also be false in some respects, even if true in others? Harper, uh, Harper also objects that if something uh, counted as ontologically false by virtue of its defects, then it would follow that it is not conformable to intellect, which would contradict the thesis that all being is so conformable. But why couldn't a thing be conformable to intellect in some respects while not in others, just as it can be good in some respects while not in others? Harper says that the divine idea of every actual existing thing represents its defects along with its perfections, so that everything will conform exactly to the divine idea and therefore not be ontologically false. But he goes on to admit that, since a defective thing will fail perfectly to correspond to what he calls the divine intellect's, quote, generic or, I or typal idea of the kind the thing falls under, the thing will exhibit, quote, traces of something that bears a distant relation, uh, res resemblance to falsity, unquote. 
Indeed, Aquinas too acknowledges that, quote, a creature has some similarity to what is false insofar as it, as it is deficient, unquote. This seems to me to come pretty close to acknowledging that a thing can be ontologically false in a stronger sense than the sense in which pyrite is false gold. Perhaps the issue is ultimately semantic. Okay, now we come to uh, the next section on some implications. Having rashly given voice to this tentative disagreement with St. Thomas, let me hasten to change the subject and turn to the implications and applications of the account of ontological or transcendental truth that I've been setting out. I'll first address some philosophical implications and then briefly note some theological applications of the doctrine. Perhaps the most fundamental philosophical consequence of truths being a transcendental property of being is that it implies the principle of sufficient reason, or PSR. PSR has been formulated in various ways, not all of them equally plausible. But the basic idea is that anything that exists or occurs is intelligible. It can be explained or made sense of. Now, this thesis is not explicit in Aquinas or other medieval or ancient thinkers. It is commonly associated with Leibniz and other modern rationalists. For that reason, one occasionally comes across commentators who suggest that its presence in modern manuals of Thomist philosophy reflects a corruption of the tradition. The worry is related to Etienne Gilson's famous contrast of the existentialism he sees in Aquinas with the essentialism of the rationalists. The rationalists try to read reality off from our abstract concepts of the essences of things, whereas Aquinas insists that knowledge begins with awareness of concrete existing things. However, even Gilson himself accepted PSR, albeit its rationalist associations kept him from putting too much emphasis on it. And the principle was more warmly embraced by prominent 20th century Thomists like Jacques Maritain, precisely because of its connection to the thesis that truth is convertible with being. Thomists certainly cannot accept rationalist epistemology or some of the dubious uses to which modern philosophers have put PSR. But the principle itself is sound and follows from the claim that uh, a claim that Thomists do accept to the effect that all being is conformable to the intellect. The second implication of the idea of truth as a transcendental property of being is that we ought to be able to reason to God's existence by way of the notion of truth, no less than by the way of the notions of being, unity, and goodness. Or to speak more cautiously, the notion of transcendental truth at least suggests, even if it does not strictly imply this. Arguments like St. Thomas's existential proof in De Ente et Essentia essentially reason to God's existence by way of the notion, the transcendental notion of being. Neoplatonic arguments to the effect that composite things must derive from an absolutely simple or non-composite cause an idea that is also clearly in Aquinas, essentially reason to God's existence by way of the transcendental notion of one or unity. Arguments that emphasize teleology, such as Aquinas' fifth way, or Aristotle's argument that God moves the world as its final cause, essentially approach God by way of the transcendental notion of goodness. If being one goodness and truth are convertible, then it stands to reason that there should also be some way to arrive at God's existence by way of the transcendental notion of truth. The Augustinian argument from eternal truths is precisely such an argument. Now, while some Thomists, myself included, have defended that argument, others are skeptical of it. Like PSR, it might seem to smack too much of rationalism to fit comfortably with Thomism. Yet, as with PSR, it isn't really modern rationalism that is the inspiration behind the relevant ideas, but rather the notion of truth as a transcendental. Now, Augustine is commonly regarded as the seminal theorist of the notion of ontological or transcendental truth, just as Aristotle is seen as the fountainhead of theorizing about logical truth. But Aquinas was no less an Augustinian than he was an Aristotelian. Hence, we ought to be wary of too quickly dismissing ideas like the ones in question as rationalist corruptions of authentic Thomism. A third philosophical implication of the notion of ontological truth is that it suggests a critique of certain forms of skepticism or an anti-realism about the world external to the mind. Haldane notes that epistemological realism, which holds that both that a mind-independent world exists and that we can have knowledge of it, requires the following two claims. One, the world is ontologically independent of thought, and two, concepts and what they represent are intrinsically related. For without one, the claim that the world is ontologically independent of thought, we wouldn't have realism. And without two, the claim that concepts and what they represent are intrinsically related, we would be trapped behind a veil of perceptions which would be the same whether or not anything lay beyond it, making knowledge of the world impossible. The trouble, Haldane points out, is that these claims one and two might seem to be incompatible. For if the world is ontologically independent of thought, how could concepts have an intrinsic relationship to it? The claim that the world's ontologically independent of thought thus might lead to, uh, seem to lead to skepticism. But if concepts are intrinsically related to, the, to what they represent, how could the world be ontologically independent of thought? Our second claim, that concepts and what they represent are intrinsically related, might therefore seem to lead to idealism, the collapse of the world into the mind. The way out of this apparent impasse, as Haldane argues, 
is provided by the Thomas thesis that cognition involves the formal identity of the knower and the known without their material identity. Because the intellect and its objects are not materially identical, the world is ontologically independent of thought. Because they are formally identical, concepts and what they represent are intrinsically related and we are not trapped behind a veil of perceptions. In other words, our two claims one and two can be reconciled by conceiving of truth, the conformity of intellect and reality, as the doctrine of the transcendentals does in terms of formal identity. Logical truth is a matter of the intellect having the same form as the thing known, and ontological truth is a matter of the, of the thing having the same form as the intellect. As Haldane also uh, points out, this account does not require commitment to the kind of semantic realism criticized by anti-realists like Michael Dummett and expressed in the thesis that the meaning of a statement is given by truth conditions that are recognition transcendent. What this thesis entails is that the conditions that make a statement true may be such that we could never even in principle know them. That kind of realism so exaggerates the independence of reality from thought that it threatens to make reality unknowable. Not only need realists not say this, in light of the doctrine that truth is a transcendental property of being, they should not say it. For if all reality is true in the sense of conforming to intellect, then there can be no such thing as an aspect of reality that is in principle unknowable. Here is a fourth and related implication. Donald Davidson famously argued that conceptual relativism is incoherent. Now, fully to spell out his reasoning would require an exposition of his general philosophy of language. But the upshot is that we cannot intelligibly count something as a conceptual scheme in the first place unless we take it both to be commensurable with our own conceptual scheme and also accurately to capture reality, at least in its broad outlines, even if not in all its details. Hence, we cannot make sense of the idea of an alternative conceptual scheme for carving up, carving up reality. Indeed, strictly speaking, we cannot make sense of the very notion of a conceptual scheme itself understood as a contingent way of carving up an otherwise unconceptualized reality. Davidson writes, quote, in giving up dependence on the concept of an uninterpreted reality, something outside all schemes and science, we do not relinquish the notion of objective truth, quite the contrary. Given the dogma uh, of a dualism of scheme and reality, we get conceptual relativity and truth relative to a scheme. Without the dogma, this kind of relativity goes by the board. In giving up the dualism of scheme and world, we do not give up the world, but reestablish unmediated touch with the familiar objects whose antics make our sentences and opinions true or false." Unquote. Now, Davidson's position is sometimes read as a kind of pragmatism, but I would argue that it is better seen as an inchoate rediscovery of the scholastic notion of truth as the conformity of intellect and reality, where this conformity has both directions of fit, mind to world and world to mind. Reality in general must be as we conceptualize it, just as our concepts must conform to reality. Or in any event, whether or not Davidson himself would welcome such a scholastic interpretation, the notion of transcendental truth affords us a way of making use of his insights without lapsing into pragmatism or the like. The idea of truth as a transcendental property of being suggests lines of criticism of other philosophical isms as well. For example, if truth is a matter of conformity of being and intellect, then, what do, we, then uh, what do we make of views that either implicitly or explicitly deny the reality of the intellect? Modern empiricism implicitly does so insofar as it collapses the intellect into the imagination. Eliminative materialism explicitly does so insofar as it takes propositional attitudes, beliefs, desires, etc., and their intentional content to be illusions. Naturally, eliminativists would deny the reality of the divine intellect as well. Now, as Aquinas notes in De Veritate, if there were no such thing as intellect, not even per, per impossibile, the divine intellect, then there would be no such thing as truth. That would entail that doctrines that deny the reality of intellect cannot by their own lights be true and are therefore self-defeating. Of course, to suggest that eliminativism is self-defeating is not a novel idea, but my point is that the scholastic notion of truth as conformity of intellect and being adds a new perspective on the matter. Then there is the theme that the ultimate ground of truth must lie in the divine intellect, since it is the locus of the archetypes according to which all things are created. This, as I've said, is the standard scholastic way of developing a realist account of the essences of things. What do we make then of views which hold that the essences of things have no foundation in reality outside the human mind and language, such as nominalism and cognitive relativism? Well, they essentially put human thought and language in the place of the divine intellect, thereby deifying them. Or to be more precise, thereby making idols of them. Now, characterizing relativism as a kind of self-deification on the part of human beings is also not a novel idea. But what I'm suggesting is that the idea of truth as a transcendental property of being also adds greater depth to that analysis. This naturally leads us finally briefly to consider a theological application of the ideas that we've been examining. Medieval theologians sometimes took the transcendental properties of being to illuminate the doctrine of the Trinity and Aquinas at least implicitly agrees. Here's how the idea works. Though the divine attributes are possessed by all the persons of the Trinity equally, a given attribute can be, quote, appropriated to one person in particular 
insofar as it reflects in a special way the manner in which we conceptualize that divine person. Hence, though all the divine persons possess power, wisdom, and love, power is associated in a special way with how we understand the Father, wisdom in a special way with how we understand the Son, and love in a special way with how we understand the Holy Spirit. Where the transcendentals are concerned, the idea is that being can be appropriated to the common divine essence and each of the three properties of being to one of the divine persons. One to the Father, true to the Son, and good to the Holy Spirit. For though these transcendental properties belong to each of the persons, appropriating them to the persons in this way reflects how we have to conceptualize each of the three divine persons and their relations to one another. The suitability of these appropriations is evident in light of Augustine's psychological model of the Trinity, in which the Father is compared to the mind, the Son to the mind's knowledge of itself, and the Holy Spirit to its love for what it knows. Since to love is to will the good of another, the transcendental good is aptly appropriated to the Holy Spirit as Augustine conceives of him. Since knowledge entails truth, the transcendental true is aptly appropriated to the Son. And since unity is prior to multiplicity, the transcendental one is aptly appropriated to the Father as that from which the other persons proceed, just as knowledge and love proceed from the mind. In De Veritate, Aquinas does explicitly endorse the appropriation of truth to the Son, and also argues that there is a special metaphorical or figurative sense in which truth is to be predicated of the Son, specifically. Quote, for in created things, truth is said to exist inasmuch as a created thing imitates its source, the divine intellect. Similarly, when truth is applied to God and is said to be the highest possible imitation of its principle, this is attributed to the Son. Taken in this way, truth properly belongs to the Son and is predicated personally, unquote. Truth is specially attributed to the Son, then, insofar as, it, as he is a perfect imitation of the Father, as created things are imitations of the archetypes pre-existing in the divine mind. This particular predication is merely figurative or metaphorical, however, insofar as the Son is uncreated. The appropriation of truth to the Son is, of course, especially apt in light of Scripture. John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that Christ is the Logos or Word, and of course the Word of God must be true. Christ tells us in John chapter 14 verse 6 that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Had Pilate only stuck around after asking his famous question, perhaps it would have dawned on him that the answer was literally staring him in the face. Thank you. Thanks very much. We have time for some questions. Uh, I have a question about uh, the ideas of artifacts. So the truth of an artifact is like, well, I guess the question is, can the idea in the artisan's mind be sure or false or more or less true? Like, is there, a, is there an idea of <clears throat> artifacts in the mind of God? Or is it part of the, his idea of man? Or would be man? Well, I, yeah, so the, the standard view uh, is that artifacts are true precisely because they conform to the human intellect and something analogous to the way that natural objects are true because they conform to the divine intellect. Because artifacts, artifactual essences are really the products of the human mind though uh, the essences of, of natural objects, natural substances, are not. So there we, we do have a, a, a kind of conformity of being to intellect that's analogous to the natural world's conformity to the divine intellect. And so in that sense, human beings create artifactual essences in a way that they, only, they discover rather than create natural essences. Ultimately, of course, God knows the essences of artifacts like he knows the essences of everything else before the foundation of the world and so forth. But what he thereby knows, you might say, is something that human beings will themselves ultimately come up with. So he knows them, you might say, in a different way than he knows the essences of natural things. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, many times it's like a great question, but I think being is not a concept. And that's, that's kind of how I mean, it's that, that So you do that? Well, so being itself is, since it's independent of mind, is not a concept, but we do have a concept of being. So it can, it can be easy to kind of slip between talk about being and talk about our concept of being. Uh, I think we can disambiguate them, but it's, it gets cumbersome when you're giving an exposition of these things to constantly you know, use the phrase the concept of being, so then we just talk about being when we, when we mean the concept. I think I avoided any fallacious slippage in my exposition. If I didn't though, please let me know. But I, I think I avoided that, but you're right that we, we, we would want to distinguish the two. The question about whether a view like this commits us to a principle of vibrance. So, for example, how, how would you make sense of uh, borderline cases, for example, of 
exclusions. Um, so people will say that when you get a sufficient number of stands, our concept of heat is sufficiently precise enough to say whether you have a heat or not. So it's neither true nor false that you have a heat. But it seems like you might say, well, there's still some answer to whether it's conforming to the divine mind on this view. But it's right. Really yeah, what I would say is that if we're talking about natural substances, there are going to be sharp um, distinctions between you know, one substance and another. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult for us to determine what, where the, li the line is to be drawn, but that's an epistemological matter rather than a, than a metaphysical matter. There is going to be an objective fact of the matter about whether something falls into a class or not, if we're talking about natural substances. If we're talking about artifactual essences, and I think a heap is, is probably best understood as an artifactual, or, or, a, or is, well, not as a true substance anyway, put it that way. A heap is really an aggregate of substances. Then there aren't necessarily going to be um, hard and fast dividing lines, because certainly we're dealing with artifactual kinds. Our artif artifactual kinds, the essences of artifacts, which are man-made things, reflect our purposes. And sometimes our purposes, sometimes uh, we're at cross-purposes, and sometimes our purposes are fuzzy, so the essences might be fuzzy. And there, be, may, there may be no objective fact of the matter in a case like that. I think that's true in the case of a heap, which arguably is a kind of man-made concept. Uh, but certainly it's not a, a heap would not be a substance, which is, I think is the key point. So I think, again, if we're talking about true substances, there is going to be, there aren't going to be any fuzzy boundaries. And if there is fuzziness in our thinking about it, it's epistemological rather than metaphysical. But if we're talking about artifacts and, and other non-substances, there may be some fuzziness, but that reflects the fuzziness of human thought, not anything in reality. So in either case, the fuzziness is, in, is not in reality itself, but only, say, in our conceptualization of it. Thank you. I'm, thinking, I'm asking this question on behalf of the, the secular neo right? So I accept, uh, I accept you know, teleology, I accept Real essences, as a real definition, you know, like maybe a red wigan or something like that. I, mean, I accept the whole picture um, of what's going on in the natural substance. Uh, and then, okay, but then I, you want me to make a further move to accept ontological truth. And maybe I'd accept like a inflationary understanding of that and say, um, a true uh, dog is one that. Has no defects in its um, conformity to the form of the dog. Or something like that. Um, but then the further move of saying there needs to be conformity to some intellect of that being in order for it to be a true dog. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering about that because it seems like I can, I can see how. Uh, the standard of its own form, which is kind of intrinsic, but then we have like this extrinsic standard of the divine intellect. I might say that you know, it's like the or something. Well, that's just changing the story. I mean, if conformity to its own <coughs> the form of God is sufficient, why do I need to have this further story about you know, the divine understanding of God? Um, well, if I, I mean, if I understand your question correctly, I mean, I want to say a couple of things. I guess I'm just repeating what I said in the paper. But for one thing, even before we get into the theology, if we're going to say that when I judge a dog to be such and such, I give you some biological account of its nature, and that what I tell you is thereby true, and that truth is we're already, you know, you're, you're describing a neo-Aristotelian who's already ready to, to get on board with all this other stuff. So therefore, uh, we understand that as the mind conforming to something that already existed prior to the mind's awareness of it. Okay, and then we add the thesis that what is in the effect must infer, in some way first be in the cause, right? So if the effect is truth in my intellect, in some way truth must have been there in what caused me to learn about it, namely the dog itself. So there must be something like truth in the dog if it got into my intellect, but it's not logical truth because it's not, it's not a matter of a true thought, it's, it's ontological truth. Okay, so that would be one step, and then the next step is, okay, yeah, but what about the case where you know, there's truth in the dog, but there's no, but truth relates to intellect in some way or other, but there's no human mind, suppose there are dogs and no human minds around, for there's no human mind in which there might even potentially come to be a concept uh, of a dog or a proposition about a dog. 
but there's still some kind of ontological truth of the dog. Where is the intellect that grounds that? Well, that's where you bring the theology in. And there you're, you're basically bringing in what I call the Augustinian proof for God's existence, which goes beyond you know, the, the analysis of, of truth per se. Um, and then you're, th- th- in that case, you're in, you're, you are into theology and going beyond just, uh, just you know, other parts of metaphysics. But uh, it's that two-step you know, sort of argument. First, what's in the effect must be in the cause. And, but secondly, if uh, truth relates to intellect in some way, but there are no human intellects around, the only thing left is a divine intellect for the Augustinian reason. That would be my... So I, I would think that the, the, the non-theistic neo-Aristotelian would at least have to be sensitive to the first stage of that argument. And then he would say, yeah, but that raises this puzzle. What, you know, if there's ontological truth, what happens in a world where a possible world there are no human intellects? Okay, now we've got to bring in theology. I hope that speaks to your question. That was a, that was a great question. And uh, I just want to make a follow-up remark. There's one place in Aquinas <clears throat> where he criticizes Aristotle a little bit openly. And I think well, we'll probably have more than one place, but this is at least one place. Where he says, it's I think in the commentary on uh, of the truth on the second substance. He says Aristotle was weak on participation. And that question, whether you realize it or not, you're not going to have a door of participation. Where you have you can go so far in terms of accounting for the truth of things in terms of their own intrinsic forms. But there comes a point where you gotta realize that the intrinsic forms of things are related somehow to an example. And if you just Aristotle just really was weak on that, you just couldn't see that. Or didn't see it from up very well. And it, it's the Platonist tradition that can see that. And Aquinas had both of these. And the great fight among Thomists is which of those is more popular, the Aristotelian story or the participation story. Uh, so I just want to put the question out there. Where, where does participation figure into the story of truth, ontological? I think it needed to get to a point where Aquinas said that truth in the primary and principal sense of the term is God. <clears throat> and if you don't have that, then truth can be very, very threatening. If all you've got is logical truth that human beings know of without any kind of, if that, if that doesn't reflect the prior ontological order of truth, the ontological order of truth is not ultimately a reflection of God then, like, whose truth is going to win? And whose truth is going to be imposed culturally? And whose take on the truth uh, becomes a big, big question. Maybe I wax on the other matters, but I just think that was a really deep and important question. I don't want to just leave us with a question. I, if that's been recorded, I will print it out and add it as a footnote to my, <laughs> my paper. I, li- I like that very much, Father. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I have a question, but I want to make sure that I understood what you said. Um, um, in the context of the Augustinian uh, argument uh, for God and some of the divine ideas, I think that he, he talked about, I think I'm not even certain, but I think I heard him say something like the divine ideas are essences. So I want to just make sure that's what he said. But for essences in, in many sense whatsoever, uh, before I ask my question, well, I guess you could say they are concepts of essences. So, I mean, you could think of an essence as something intrinsic to the thing that has the essence. Right. So there's my essence, and there's the essence of the water in this bottle and so forth. And then there's God's idea or concept of the essence. Or to be more precise, there's something in God analogous to what we would call in us an idea of a concept or essence. Then my question for people is going to be about essences and ideas. Are they the difference in that? Uh, essences enter into composition of things. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a sense in which like uh, ideas do uh, are kind of essential. But the, there's this, there's a, a difference between like the essence uh, in the other com- the two concrete modes of fear in the, in the intellect or uh, um, in the concrete substance. But you, you're saying that it, you know it's like a it's like the concept of the essence or something. What's in God is the concept of the essence or the idea of the essence, right, rather than the essence itself. So, you know, the essence of water 
isn't in God, certainly not in the sense in which it's in the water, or, or otherwise God would be water, right? But it's the, uh, it's the concept of the essence of water that's in God, that pre-exists in God. Again, something analogous to the concept of the essence pre-exists in God as the archetype by reference to which he creates water. I mean, we have one final question. I, uh, I definitely agree with the idea that the good part of that and the divine ideas are, are necessary to talk about the extent to which a dog lives up to this exemplar of what a dog ought to be. Um, it seemed like you said at one point, maybe I misunderstood, it, it seemed like you said at one point that divine ideas are required for realism about essences. Um, and I guess I wanted to push back on that a little bit. It seems like if, if the essence is a real causal principle within the thing, you can get your realism about the essences just by the thing. Um, so, so I wondered. Yeah, I, well, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I didn't mean to say that without qualification. I would see it as analogous to, say, real, realism about causality, right? So we can argue for realism about causality independently of theology, independently of the natural theology, even while at the same time saying that if, if you're ultimately going to have a complete account of causality and how it exists at all, you have to appeal to a divine uncaused cause as, you know, imparting to things their causal power at every moment. You need the doctrine of divine concurrence and so forth. But, you could, but that's a two-stage argument, right? So you don't have to argue by, for causality by immediately doing theology. There's an intermediate stage. And so in the same way, you know, you're, yes, you can argue for realism about truth without bringing theology into it. But, you're, but the position you take, just like the position you take about causality, is going to raise questions that ultimately are, so the Thomist would argue, and so the Augustinian would argue, going to lead you to, uh, to a kind of natural theology, in this case, in the, in the form of the Augustinian uh, argument from eternal, eternal truths, say. Uh, just as in the case of causality, you're led by the second way, say, to a divine first cause. Thank you. That's really helpful. Sure.